year with so much uncertainty, investors, at least lately, have been choosing the storyline of hope and optimism. Already today, we've talked about the vaccine rollout in the UK and the hopes for getting to that rollout story here in this country. And we've seen record highs for the NASDAQ this week, for the Dow Jones this week. And there's a look at the TSX, where the economic recovery story has been alive and well, so much so that our benchmark has added more than $980 billion worth of market valuation since the March lows. Let's get some more on the market rally, where it leaves us heading into 2021, and what truly is the economic storyline that we need to focus on. David Rosenberg, strategist and chief economist with Rosenberg Research, joining us with his year review and perhaps an outlook for the year ahead. Uh, David, always nice to see you. I guess let's let's start with where we are in the markets today as we're, we're starting to wrap up the year and your assessment of how the market has interpreted this year and where we're going. Right. Well, look, John, I, I think that you hit it uh, off very well with the opening when you said the markets have been on a, on a one-way ticket north since March. Uh, you didn't say, you know, since the Pfizer announcement. Uh, you didn't say since the Moderna announcement. Uh, you said since March, because really, uh, what does the central focus point here have been central banks and especially the most important central bank on the planet, which is the Fed. So the really big inflection point this year, and really it's been the gift that keeps on giving, uh, was when in April uh, the Fed came out uh, in the morning uh, and said that they were going to be not just expanding QE, but moving into the market for corporate credit, uh, including high yield. So when you're an equity investor, and you see that the central bank is going to be taking the discount rate, you know, what you would discount the future cash flows with, uh, which are interest rates in the corporate market. You're telling investors, we are going to converge over time uh, the discount rate with the risk-free rate, and then tell the markets that the risk-free rate is going to stay at zero for at least the next three years. Uh, then what happens is you have people starting to tell you, well, the P multiple, let's say the CAPE is 33. Boy, that looks really expensive. Um, but actually, in this environment of uh, the discount rate converging on zero, then there's no limit to how far the multiple goes. Uh, and that's the story for the stock market. And so it's you, you think it might be about the vaccine um, and the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, and the vaccine really, to me, is obviously from a social and a human perspective is unbelievably great news. From a market perspective, really, John, it's the, it's the cherry on the cake. But the cake was already there and built by the Federal Reserve. Uh, so we are in a huge financial asset bubble. But, you know, as my hero Bob Farrell always used to say, bubbles will last longer than you think, uh, but they don't correct by going sideways. Uh, and we know they end in tears, and so will this one. And when it does, it's going to be because, oops, what do you know? As a government, we overstimulated, inflation came back, and interest rates all of a sudden aren't at zero anymore. Uh, and that could be some time away. But that's really when you're looking for the catalyst for when all this ends in the stock market or in financial assets in general. It's going to be when inflation uh, moves uh, from death uh, to dormancy uh, to having a pulse that causes interest rates to back up that this party comes to an end. So let's let's put some context around what happens in 2021, because most of the conversation recently has been about rolling out vaccines. Um, sure, there are people that don't want to take a vaccine. Uh, sure, it's pretty hard to say that, uh, um, you know, uh, enough people will get the vaccine fast enough to bring down the covid case count. But but there has been that optimism in the marketplace. Uh, let's say that things are not as impressive as what we would hope. Um, what then becomes the role of the central banks in 2021? Are you saying they're, they're basically still there? They're there to backstop the same way they in many ways have been in 2020? Look, this is, uh, you know, we used to talk about the Greenspan put back in the old days. I, I mean, this is the Greenspan put uh, on steroids. So, yes, um, you know, uh, because of the Fed, you know, who would have thought that with COVID, with COVID, the S&P 500 uh, is at 3,700. If we didn't have COVID, if we didn't have COVID this year, uh, the S&P would be 3,200 right now. <clears throat> so in the most bizarre 
you would say almost perverse way, COVID has added 500 points or 13% to the S&P 500. Why? Because of what the Fed is doing. Uh, and um, Powell already came out and said that we are leaving rates at zero uh, through to 2023, even if we get to the magical holy grail of 2% or hopefully higher, that's what they want. And even when we blow through full employment, we are not touching the policy rate. Um, so this is going to be the mother of all reflation trades if it works. Now, if you're saying that maybe there's delays that say we don't reach herd immunity sometime next year, uh, there'll be some potholes. But mostly, when you think about it in the value stocks, in those reflationary reopening cyclical stocks, they will suffer. But you see, they don't comprise a very big share of the stock market. So there'll just be a rotation into those defensive growth, big cap, big, um, big cap tech names and consumer staples that will probably hold the market together. So really what happens is you get a shift from value uh, to growth. Um, and then all along, the Fed is just going to continue to pump the system with liquidity. I imagine the Bank of Canada will do the same, the Bank of England, the ECB, where when they say, quotes, we're all in this together, this is a massive uh, liquidity infusion that we're seeing right now. But make no mistake, I'm looking at the money supply numbers in the United States. And you know I've been a long-time bond bull, secular bond bull, secular disinflation deflationist. Uh, I think I'm getting closer to the end of the road on that call because money matters. Mm. And you got M1 now. M1 is at 56% year-over-year growth. M2 at 25%. We never saw this in the 1970s. So I would just say to the viewers that at such time as this monetary explosion uh, starts to offset the contraction of money velocity, and this is the big risk. And by the way, this is the big risk to the federal government and their assumptions uh, for uh, the next five, six years that we can just finance these deficits at zero interest rates. Uh, inflation, I think that the risk here is that we're going to overstimulate. Uh, the monetary creation is going to offset, more than offset the contraction and velocity of money. I know I'm talking like an economics 101 professor, but these are very important. <laughs> that that the risk that the risk is that inflation comes back sooner rather than later, and that might not be a 2021 story, it might be a 2022 story. Um, but that that to me is the real principal risk uh, behind, all, especially when you look at the um, the fiscal projections in Ottawa, they all hinge. That sustainability hinges on. Uh, <laughs> on a multi-year period of zero rates. And I think that is truly mm. pie in the sky. Well, I'm an econ grad. I'd be happy to have that conversation all day. Um, we're, we're getting close to the opening bells, David. So before I let you go, just for everyone who's listening to what you, you're saying and might have some concerns about a point when stocks do turn, is there a certain moment you'd be watching for, like the catalyst for a change in opinion on betting on stocks because rates are so low? Well, I think what you want to pay attention to, and, and, and this is something that would take me probably at best you know, 10 to 15 minutes to explain, but we, we want to pay attention yeah. to the pressures on inflation. Uh, we want to focus on the aggregate supply curve and aggregate demand curve. Everybody focuses on GDP. So I'm focused on stuff like labor force participation rates. I'm focused on productivity. Uh, and so I'm focused a lot on how the supply and demand curves are, are shifting. Uh, because when you get supply and demand right, you get the price. And inflation, after all, is the rate of change of the price. And when I think about how the markets could be mispriced and how policy might be overstimulating, it's going to be that inflation comes around the corner. Inflation comes around the corner. And, and market interest rates are forced higher, irrespective of what the central banks are doing, then I'd say it's game over. Uh, it's just a matter of timing. Uh, so inflation, inflation and interest rates uh, are the most important thing. We've really got an extended period here uh, because inflation is low. Disinflation, interest rates can remain where they are right now, and that gives you this inflated PE multiples in the stock market. That game ends when and if inflation starts to come back. Well, we'll look forward to having you back to talk about how all of this does unfold. David, thanks a lot. Really appreciate your time this morning. Thank you very much. David Rosenberg, strategist and chief economist at Rosenberg Research.